uh, show on the welcome to 122 Ministries, a gathering of friends um, that will you will be watching us on YouTube. And we're going to watch a video from on the advent of Jesus from Derwin Gray. And then we're going to talk about it here. So thank you all for being with us and joining us on YouTube. When we give somebody uh, a particularly special gift, we've really been creative. And I, I must admit, I'm very poor at this. <laughs> uh, but when we've given somebody, and I've at least said a few times, some are more creative than others, but you give somebody a really neat gift, you are expecting them to respond in, uh, with gratitude and maybe even in a particular way. Maybe uh, if you feel really proud of yourself, <laughs> so to speak, uh, you want a certain thing, but think of a time when you have given a gift that you, you thought was special and the recipient responded in a different way than you expected. Can you, can you think of that? Come up with a story? Larry, I see you smiling and nodding. Share, share with us what you're thinking about. Oh, but 20, twenty years or so ago, the Brighton ladies' purses were all the rage, you know. And Dixie wanted one. It was like two hundred dollars. Well, that was really, really seemed like a lot of money, but her birthday was coming up. And uh, she never liked practical things for her birthday. She wanted flowers or chocolate or something, you know, romantic, if you will. One time I tried a shower head for the shower. I got in trouble for that. But anyway, so I knew she yeah. wanted this bright purse. Well, that was $200 or something. Well, cell phones had come out on the market. So I went and I got each a cell phone, put it in a gift bag <laughs> and gave it to her. And as soon as she pulled the tissue paper out and saw that cell phone, you could just see the countenance fall from her face. And I immediately said, oh, and the next thing is we're going to go down to that store downtown and get that Brighton purse, yeah. which I had no intent of getting. <laughs> but to see that countenance fall and reject that gift, and I knew I was in trouble when I bought it. I knew I was in trouble when she opened it. But we did go, and we got that Brighton purse, and I'm still the proud owner of it. You rescued the moment. Well, yeah. uh, smart man. Some, sometimes the the, the – the most thoughtful gifts. We're we're just sure this is the right gift. And sometimes even the most thoughtful gifts aren't really fully appreciated. And uh, even though Jesus was rejected by his people and continues even today to be rejected, uh, he's still Emmanuel. He's still, he is still God with us. That, that doesn't, because you say this isn't so, doesn't change the truth. This, that's like saying, well, I don't, I don't think the Empire State Building is tall. Well, yeah, it is. You can believe that it's not, but it is, okay? So he has not rejected us. He has not forgotten about us, forsaken us. Uh, he still loves us greatly. He continues to pursue us, even though we've rejected him. Um, and and our, our teacher today, Derwin Gray, uh, wants us to experience Christmas as an invitation, invitation um, by the Lord, by Jesus to join him. So think about... Um, these questions, Darwin's going to answer them. Why did? Why do you think Jesus chose to die for us, even though he was despised and rejected? And and think about too, what good has grace brought to us? What good has grace brought to us? Why did Jesus choose to die? for us, even though he was rejected, and what good has grace 
brought to us. Think about those two questions while we watch this video. So, oh my goodness, let's, uh, here we go. I want you to imagine for Christmas, you, you, you've worked hard to earn enough money to give your child the perfect gift. And you put the gift under the tree, and on Christmas morning, your child runs down in their pajamas, they go under the tree, and they begin to tear off all of the wrappings, and they get to the gift, and they look at it and say, well, what is this? I don't, I don't want this. Can you imagine how you would feel well, I want you to think about this, that Jesus was a rejected king that his own people, that you and I said, I don't want this. Uh, we are going to celebrate the king who's rejected, but in his rejection, he would not stop pursuing us. He, he would not stop loving us. So uh, the king, Jesus, the Lord of all of creation, was was despised. Um, that's what the prophet Isaiah says. He, he, was, he was despised and he was rejected. Have you ever been despised? Have you ever been rejected? That's what I love about our God of incarnation is that Christmas is about Emmanuel. God is with us and he was tempted in every single way. And if anybody can relate to us, it's him. Like we have a God who's not only relational, but we have a God who relates to us. He understands rejection, but in the midst of that, he is still pursuing us. I, I want to take you to the book of Mark. And we're going to look at Mark chapter 15, verses 6 through 15, at this pivotal point in the life and ministry of Jesus. It reads this way. At the festival, Pilate used to release for the people, that's the Jewish people, a prisoner whom they requested. There was one named Barabbas who was in prison with rebels who had committed murder during their rebellion. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them as was his custom. Pilate answered them, do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? That's Jesus for he knew it was because of envy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so they would release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate asked him again, then what do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Again, they shouted, crucify him. Pilate said to them, why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. They asked for Barabbas. And, and here's the, the irony of this story. The, the name Barabbas in Hebrew means son of the father. Bar means son. Abbas means father. The son of the father. And Jesus is the true son of the father. So, so here we are with the crowds. They're asking for Barabbas. Barabbas was a part of a Jewish sect called the Zealots. And the way they wanted to usher in the Messiah was through violence and through fighting the Romans. And Barabbas actually caused an insurrection. A riot was arrested for murder. So he is guilty. But then you have Jesus, the one who knew no sin, the one who lived a, a sinless, innocent, the most beautiful life ever lived. Jesus in his humanity was rejected. The, the crowd said, give me Barabbas. We, we know he's guilty. We, we know he's not a good man, but this Jesus crucify him. Now, let me pause here. The word crucifixion, 
is, is so heinous. The, the act of crucifixion is, is so bad that upstanding Roman families will not even use the word crucifixion, that Roman law prevented anyone that was a Roman from being crucified. And a crucifixion was only for men. Crucifixion was so bad that a Latin word was developed for it. The word excruciatas, which means excruciating. So when you say excruciating, like all oh, that pain was excruciating, you are literally saying out of the cross. And so the people wanted Jesus to be crucified, even though he was innocent. And they wanted Barabbas, even though he was guilty, to be set free. Uh, in this irony, you see that Jesus is doing what it is that he came to do. The innocent one gives his life for the guilty ones. In reality, you and I are Barabbas. You and I are born separated from God. You and I are born guilty, but because God is overwhelmed with love for us, because God has desired to know us and for us to know him, he sends Jesus. I want you to listen to Isaiah 53. And once again, this was written 700 years before Jesus was born. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness or sin was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. But here's the great thing about our, our God is, is we can't even see him without him first seeing us. That even desire to know him is a gift and he asks us to unwrap the gift so that we can see that Christmas, even though presence under a tree is good, but the greatest gift is God's presence on a tree. So think about this, on, on the one hand, it is an incredible tragedy that should break our hearts, but the Son of Man had to be broken to break the power of sin. The cross was not God's plan B. The cross was not God going, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? We have a God who is never surprised. We have a God who is proactive. He is not reactive. That the cross is God's eternal provision to bring his family home. The cross is God's grace to a people that needs it. We are all born with this with this virus called sin. And perhaps you're saying, well, you know what, uh, Pastor, I, I don't think that's fair. Well, the way I look, I got it. I'm a bigger version of my dad is we are like twins. Um, I didn't ask for it. That's just what I got. Well, guess what? Because you and I are sons and daughters of Adam, we inherited the spiritual genetics of Adam, which is spiritual separation from God. The Bible calls that a sinner. Even the good things we do are tainted by selfishness. We are born spiritually dead. That's why the suffering servant comes, that he gives his life so that he can take it back up to give us his life to live through us. That's what it means to be born again, is that the living God of the universe is, I'm gonna share my life with you. So, in this Advent season, I, I want you to think about how we've rejected God, but he continues to knock on the door, how we've rebelled against him, but he continues to pursue us, that when we were lost, he was found us. When we tried to hide, he was in our hiding place. You see, Christmas is about Jesus. So as we're giving gifts, as we're receiving gifts, may it be a mere shadow of the greatest gift of all. The greatest news in all of history. God decided to show up not in a 747, not on a, a fighter plane, not in a spaceship, but in the womb of a teenage girl. He was rejected so that we would never have to be. Grace calls us out of hiding. Here's the beautiful thing about God's grace is is God does for us what we could never do for ourselves. 
God forgives us, God loves us, God is merciful for us. God is grace in Christ saying, I already know you don't have to hide from me. Way back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They first started to hide and they covered themselves with fig leaves. Here's the good news. God says you don't have to hide and you don't have to cover yourself with fig leaves because he wants to cover you with grace. Grace calls us out of condemnation for all those who are in Christ are no longer condemned. This is what this means is you are forgiven, you are cherished, you are loved. That's the meaning of Christmas. Christmas is an invitation to meet the rejected King. For those of us who, who follow Jesus, we, we can walk in freedom. And you know what freedom is? Freedom is not doing anything we want to do. Freedom is loving God and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. That's where joy and happiness is. Joy and happiness aren't necessarily feelings, they're purpose. That's where peace is. Peace isn't the absence of conflict. Peace is God in the midst of the conflict. Peace does not mean that we don't go through uh, um, turbulent times. It means that in those turbulent times, there is purpose and there is love. And we know that Emmanuel, God is with us. The rejected king never rejects us. Uh, the spirit of this season moves us to experience what it means to know and to follow Jesus. Now, I'm not assuming that everyone watching knows Jesus. August 2nd, 1997 is, is when I met him. That's when I met Jesus. I, I was my fifth year in the NFL. I was at training camp and I was in a small dorm room. It was right after lunchtime. And despite the money, despite the girl, despite all the stuff I thought that I ever wanted, I was still miserable. I was still broken. I was still lived in fear. I, I knew I needed to be forgiven, but I just didn't know how. And I called my wife on the phone and I said this to her. I said, I want to be more committed to you and I want to be committed to Jesus. And that's when I was born again. That's when the love of God washed over me. It was a free invitation. Well, he wants to invite you to know him as well. Listen to Isaiah 53. It says this about Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness or sin was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed because of our inequities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We've all turned to our own way and the Lord has punished him for the inequity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and he had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed and will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. So as you think about Christmas and, and you see that tree and those gifts under the tree, may it be a symbol of the greatest gift of all, God's presence on a tree. And on that tree was the God-man, Jesus. As the God-man, he grabbed your hand and with his other nail-pierced hand, he grabbed his father's hand and through faith in him, by his blood, through his sacrifice, he brings us back together to his father. God wants you to experience that. Reject him no more. Today is your day.
right now where you are, um, if you're saying, hey, preacher, I want to know who Jesus is. I want to experience him. I want you to say this to him. He's listening. He is present. Say this to him. Say, King Jesus, today I receive your sacrifice. I believe and I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you died and you rose again to forever forgive me and to make me new and to make me a part of your family. I receive your gift. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Yeah. Can you hear me again? I was clicking buttons anyway. What did you uh, hear today that that was uh, remarkable to you? What what was what stood out? Different, new, whatever it might be. Well, I tell you, the most interesting thing to me wasn't even his study presentation, if you will, but it was his very, very short testimony. You know, he was, he, even though he didn't say it in these terms exactly, it was apparent that he was willing to give it all up to follow Jesus. And uh, that, that alone was a good enough message for me. <laughs> I mean, it was all good, but that impacted me. Uh <clears throat> Um, there is a this has impressed me for I don't know last several days it has before but certainly recently and I, I think of it I can't explain it well but it seems to be um, that we we have to accept it all or the, the message of the Lord, we, we accept it all or we reject it all. In other words, you can't, I can't take part of the message or most of it or 99% of it and say, yeah, that's true. I believe that but leave something out. If I do, and I, I'm not talking about just being ignorant or stupid or which I am, but I'm talking about deciding that my way is a better way. Just in a small thing, uh, you know, my way is a better way. What I've actually done, and I'm impressed with this, and I may be wrong, but when I say I'm going to do it the way I think is right, then what I've actually done is say, I don't believe what you said, God. I don't believe you. Now, you know, you can say, well, no, I don't, but be careful about that. I, I'm, I'm tempted to say, yeah, that's not true. You can accept part of it in there's, there is eventual change, but I think that there is some truth to what I'm thinking, that if I say I'm going to be prideful, I'm going to be whatever in this one little thing, then actually I'm, I'm selling myself short of what needs to be done. And maybe, maybe there is a process to being a 100 percenter, or maybe there's something else to it, but I think I'm, I'm certainly missing what could be by saying, no, I choose my way instead of God's way, even the smallest thing. Some things are big things, some things are small things, but what I'm saying is they all matter. So let me just throw that out with you to think about. I, I, I'm feeling that in my heart lately, 
that I need to be a 100 percenter. I need to surrender, as Larry said. I, I still, I still hold on to some of the things that I think I can do better, or I can do right, or it's up to me, or whatever. Uh, instead of surrendering everything to God and centering myself with Him. So anyway. <laughs> That's just a little extra there, but it got me, this got me thinking about it. And I want to be, uh, you know, we like, like this, we can look at this uh, crowd rejecting Jesus and choosing to release Barabbas. That's a big thing. We, we would say that's a big thing. Oh man, how stupid can you be? You know, what, what an, what an idiot this, these people are. Well, what I'm saying is, I'm just as guilty by choosing some little tiny thing. It's I wouldn't reject Jesus. I wouldn't say crucify him. I might not say that, but what I would say is, no, nah, I'm going to do this like I want to do, which is really the same thing. It's really this just as bad. So. I'm infected with this. I, it, it may be a minor thing, but I still have this disease of, of not being fully committed to God. Do you see what I'm saying? There, there can be a big, there can be a big thing. Oh no, I'm not going to believe. I don't believe in Jesus. Bull crud. I don't. Whatever. And you, we would look at that person and say, man, they're a, they're an atheist or whatever all the way down to, oh, no, I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher, I'm a, but I'm going to choose, I can't even think about it, I'm going to, I'm going to choose to watch an R-rated movie. To me, it's just as bad. It, it seems like it's just as bad. I'm, I'm rejecting God. I'm not submitting to what it should be. So be careful. I, I think I should be careful, or maybe we should, about uh, looking at this story, you know, in Mark, where the people said, no, give us Barabbas, crucified Jesus. And, and we say, oh, man, what a terrible thing. I wouldn't do that. Well, maybe we do. Maybe we're just as guilty. Um, uh, maybe we ought to consider that. So um, I, I want us to think about that today and decide uh, how we're going to deal with that. Are you, are you, um, do you, do you feel rejected like Jesus did? Do you feel accepted like Barabbas was? Uh, and what difference does that make? Is that an irony uh, or is there some difference of that? I thought it was interesting too what Derwin said about crucifixion and how it equates to the word excruciating. It's kind of the same base word. I never had heard that before, but this was certainly amplified this rejection that we're talking about. This the the king of the world, the universe, was despised and rejected. In, in this story in an obvious way, but what I'm think what I'm saying is let's think about less obvious things, excuse me, that maybe you and I do that would put us in the same category that needs that forgiveness, that needs that grace that Derwin talked about. Well, I uh, go ahead. I think what I take from some of that is I can learn from Jesus the fact that um, or I try to learn this lesson every day um, that even though he was rejected he chose to go ahead and obey what you know the will was for him and I remember I don't know word for word but I know in my heart um how he was freaking out and he went off and he prayed god please take this cup from me 
uh, he was scared, but he went ahead and he obeyed the Lord anyway. That's huge for me to learn yeah. from. It, it, to use Larry's word, he surrendered. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, even though, man, I really want to live. I want to, I want to, I don't want this excruciating pain. I don't want uh, this starting with rejection and despisement all the way to this physical pain he had to go through. I don't want any of that, Lord. Is there another way? Can we do this? And yet, it, it's incomprehensible to my mind that he would say, no, I'm, I know that this is best. I know it has to be done. And I love humanity so much that I will go through all that is going to happen to me in order to make this plan work. And by the way, uh, I was interesting, and again, I, I know this, but um, hard to soak it in sometimes. God is not reactive. He is proactive. This didn't surprise him. This, this necessity of rejection and despisement and crucifixion, none of this, none of this was a surprise. He didn't, as Darwin said, he didn't come up with plan B. This was something that was set in motion. It had to happen this way. So we, we inherited this sin from Adam. Like Darwin said, you know, that's not really fair. I don't think I'm a bad person. I haven't done. Well, you inherited that problem from Adam. And really, when you get right down to it, even though maybe I didn't do so many terrible things that we would, that society or the world would call bad, uh, you know, done pretty good. I can look at myself, man, I've done, I've done all right. It only takes one little wrong to ruin it. Only one fly ruins the ointment. So uh, it doesn't matter what the scale is, what scale we put on it. You know, have you been a really bad person or you've been just sort of bad? The fact is, it's bad. <laughs> Sin is inherited. So uh, no, no scale. The scale isn't important. That's only a man-made thing. Or even when he was talking about because of what we inherited, you know, our sinful nature and selfishness, even when we're doing something good, he mentioned our motives behind that too. You know, our yeah. naturally... Naturally, we're, you know, our motives just naturally are not appropriate most of the time. <laughs> right. We, we will, uh, one of the things I, I read somewhere not too long ago, um, it was talking about, it was a book talking about um, people that, witnessing to people that reject God that have already made this decision to be atheist, we call atheist or whatever, but they, they've decided, no, there's no such thing. I, I'm not a believer. I'm not going to be, you know, you, you've heard of or know people like that. Uh, one of the things they, they say, or she talked about in this book was when you encounter people like that and you're witnessing to them or trying to explain this to them, you need to ask Ask them, how do you account for evil? There Certainly, I'm not calling you evil, you, you would say. You know, maybe you've been a good person, a good person, but there is evil out there. There are Hitlers in the world. There are murderers. There are people that do things that we would, that we would call bad. Well, ask them, how do you account for that? Where did that come from? So then they have to say, well, you made a choice. Now, they may not say, you know, the devil made me do it or whatever. 
But the fact is they have to agree with you that there is a choice. And there, some people are influenced to choose badly. Some people are influenced to choose what we would call good. But there are, there are maybe stages of that we would classify. But where does it come from? So uh, again, a free little factoid I'm throwing out. But uh, it made me think of that. You've got to account for that somehow. You, you have to account for evil. Now, the Bible says we've inherited it. And, and I choose to believe that. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's just, I had to. I had to. The Bible says you were a slave to sin one time before you knew the Lord. You had to sin. You were a slave to that. You inherited it. You grew into it. But by the grace of God, now grace is another word there that, that continues today. Um, we, we can, even if we choose consciously, choose to do wrong, we're still offered grace. And it's just an amazing, uh, amazing thing, amazing grace. Um, it was, the, the grace is God's choice. Uh, again, seated in his love, coming from his love, he was rejected so that we wouldn't have to be. Have you ever been rejected? Have you, have you ever, has somebody ever said, I don't want you, you're no good. They didn't pick you for the game. They didn't remember your birthday. They didn't, whatever it might be. There's a million ways. I'm, I'm almost certain I can say we've all felt rejection at one time or another. <clears throat> the, the thing we don't have to feel because of God is we don't have to feel and experience the ultimate rejection. Now, we might, if we choose not to follow him, that's one of those things that we benefit, we gain by, by choosing God, uh, among other things, is the, the benefit of not ever having to be rejected, ultimately rejected. So that only his grace uh, covers that. I like to uh, freedom. He said this freedom, uh, which I'm I'm really just beginning to understand. But freedom is not the ability to choose whatever you want to do. Really, freedom is loving God and loving others. That is true freedom. That is where that lives. That is where that resides. Uh, when you choose uh, to love God and love others, then, only then, are you free. Now, we've defined it a different way. The world has defined it differently. Freedom is democracy. Freedom is I'm not subjected politically to someone else. Freedom is I'm not a slave to a black person to a white person. Um, freedom is, you know, in a sense that's true, but, but real freedom is choosing to love God and love others. That is the definition of freedom. And you can only receive that from God. You can't receive it anywhere in the world. You, you may think you have, but you won't. We can talk about being not racist or uh, being reconciled in the race situation or this or that. We go, oh, yeah, yeah, we can do all that. We can't really get there until we choose God. We cannot be free until we choose God. And, and his character is to love each other, to love him, to love each other. That is where freedom is. That is where joy is. That is where life is. Scripture says it's over and over and over. That is the only place 
you can get this stuff. We choose all these different ways of getting there. We're trying to get there. We're picking this, we're picking that. We're, oh man, I'm, I, I gotta get happy. I gotta do only one. There's only one way. That's what that means. That is the answer. And we, we, we took that and rejected it all in the Old Testament. I wanted to look at some places that and he alluded to them. Isaiah 50, chapter 52. Um, chapter 52, verses 13 through 15. See my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured, he did not look like a man. In his form did not resemble a human being. So he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, for they will see what had not been told them, and they will understand what had not been heard. So again, you're talking about the rejected king. Even in rejection, he's, he's doing what was planned. He was lifted up. Just like the snake, the, the symbol of the snake in the wilderness in, in uh, the story of the Exodus, uh, they lifted up this picture of the snake and it saved them. That was a... That was a uh, an illustration of what was going to happen. So even though he was rejected and despised, his lifting up brought glory. It shut him up. Okay, literally closed their mouth, opened their eyes. Uh, let me let me read chapter fifty three, verse four. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses. And by the way. I thought it was interesting that uh, some translations, instead of using sicknesses, uses sin. Yet he himself bore our sin. But actually, it says sicknesses. Did you ever think that sickness equals sin? I mean, literally, uh, it's the same thing. And Jesus bore our sicknesses. How many, of you ever, how many people have been sick? Have you ever been sick? Of course you have. Nobody's perfectly healthy. Okay. You've had a cold. You've had the flu. You've had whatever it might be. We're, we're fighting this COVID thing now. But Jesus took away and bore those sicknesses, that sin. So uh, let's let's... Use that illustration to show you, instead of just being that word of sin that we kind of lose the meaning, it's actually sicknesses, physical, mental illnesses, okay? Jesus bore them, and he carried our pains, pain, ouch. How many have ever hurt before? Of course you have. Well, Jesus bore that. You don't have to. He bore it. But we in turn regarded him stricken and struck down by God and afflicted. And then in, in Matthew uh, chapter 18, let me turn there real quick. Still having trouble with my right hand, although it's getting better. Matthew 18, verses 14 through 17. Remember what I just read. In the same way, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones will perish. If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen to you, uh, take one or two with you so that by the testimony, of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention to the church, let him be a Gentile and a tax collector to you. In other words, 
go back to that. So what this is saying is showing the rejection of Jesus and the rejection of us. That's not a permanent, but it's only to reconcile you. And there are several others, Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, just an excellence we all, but our, he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. And then that's, that's uh, uh, answered in 1 Peter, uh, or shown in 1 Peter, that uh, that rejection of the Lord is actually our reconciliation. It turned into the opposite uh, of what we originally intended for. People said, crucify him, get rid of him. But actually that rejection only glorified him. And now we, we uh, receive the benefit of that. And there are other passages that reflect that. So let me let me ask you, uh, and Derwin Derwin does is I think uh, I, I think I know the answer, but have you connected the the prophecies in Isaiah uh, to Jesus at least generally? Uh, you may not know them all, and you may not say, "Well, yeah, this 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 is this this is this," but you see, I think that. The, the rejection of the Savior of Jesus was, in fact, our salvation, ultimate salvation. Do you see that? How it was presented historically and then came to fulfillment? And if you do, I, I, you, really the, the big question is, Um, well, I can't think of a good way to say it, but if we have, if we understand that rejection is ironically our salvation, our salvation, that it, it, it scripture, the Isaiah says, he had to be rejected. It, it wasn't. It wasn't even. You know, what, there there wasn't a, a, a chance that the people would say, "Oh no, give us. Uh, we'll take Jesus, kill Barabbas." The the fact is, it had to be done that way. God planned it that way. Excuse me. He meant for it to be that way, and it's it's a sad thing. We we hate that it had to happen. But it did. And it had to happen that way so that we would not experience that rejection. We wouldn't ever have to hear God say, we wouldn't have to have hear God say, I reject you. You must go away from me. Now we can choose that, but we can also choose not to be rejected because he was. So contemplate that uh, during this time of, of Christmas. Um, again, I, I don't want it to be just pretty lights and buying presents and, oh, by the way, yeah, uh, we're celebrating Jesus' birthday, blah, blah, blah. Let's, let's make it special. Let's consider that, that this whole season, this whole idea of Christmas, even though we've made it commercial and made it a holiday and et cetera, et cetera. And that's all nice. That's okay. But let's, let's consider that this is a celebration of Jesus coming. And in this case today, we're looking has, at his despisement and rejection, but it had to happen that way so that we all could experience our we, we could experience life instead of 
death. We could never choose never to have to experience that rejection. Will you do that with me? Work on that uh, during these next weeks? I hope, I hope so, and I pray that you will. Uh, anybody have anything else you'd like to share today? When uh, just just think about God loved His people, even though even though in we say despite, but uh, He knew that would happen. It didn't surprise Him again. Uh, even though they rebelled against Him, God loved His people. He loves us too, no matter how we might stray. No matter if we choose the world or, or him, he still loves us. His love is always uh, present, no matter where we might go. And as Darwin said, God wants us all. He wants all of us to know his love and his acceptance. He'll never reject those who come to him uh, with a repentant heart and a joyful heart. So I hope this season is, uh, you know, I, I realize it may be difficult for some of you and it, and it may be a challenge for some of you. And certainly there'll be days when that are better than others, but I, I want it to overall to be a season of recognizing what it's all about, Jesus, came and faced what he had to face in order that we could be all that we're, we're meant to be, all that we can be in Christ. So I want to uh, let me read this scripture to you today. I've read it before, but um, a prayer to, for you, because I want us to go um, and be sent. I want I want to, as your uh, so-called leader, uh, to send you out. Now I want you to go to the world, and in whatever way that might be, um, my my capacity as a retired person is different than a young person like uh, Jennifer or Kyron. Or, or somebody that uh, does things more, maybe I want to say more actively, but all of us need to be sent out. We need to go and present this message to the world. So I kneel before the Father today, uh, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ, the rejected, crucified Savior, may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, true love, God's love, may have power together with all God's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. Take his power, friends. Take his love that will give you abilities that are, that are miraculous, that can do things you can't, you think can't be done. He can do them. Choose to center on him. Now to him who is able to be, to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Let this be so.
Amen. I pray that for you and me right now in Jesus' name. Thank you. Uh, we'll see all you guys uh, soon again, uh, later in the week. Have a good Thanksgiving week. Uh, don't eat too much. I plan on it, but I don't want you to. <laughs> uh, so have a good week this week. Love you all very much. We'll see you very soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Love Bye, you Jennifer. Too. Bye. Bye-bye. See you, Larry.